Okay, so I'm going to talk about, as we, I guess we almost have everyone in, and this should still just be introductory material, uh, about scalable real-time architectures in Python. What do I mean by that? I want you to walk away from this session with a couple of key ideas, okay? Um, specifically around partitioning and fault tolerance and how we can achieve that in building such scalable real-time architectures. My focus will be on Storm, but the ideas are applicable to other tools as well, uh, such as Spark, Streaming, or tools that you might roll yourself. And I think the reason that we want to be doing this is, of course, we're dealing with more data, but we also want to be more responsive to that data. I will show Python, but more at the end. So I'm core developer Jython. You may have seen my State of Jython lightning talk yesterday. Uh, I, let me plug this book if you're ever interested in Jython. Um, this is a great book. I work at Rackspace on these types of issues. I have had the chance to work in um, distributed computing for a while and especially failures at scale. I teach the Principles of Programming Language course occasionally at uh, the University of Colorado which is fun, but actually is done in Scala, um, not Python. And I um, work with this uh, user meetup on Storm. We're probably gonna be changing this to real-time streaming in the near future. What sort of real-time architectures would you like to build? Well, I can think of a few, and I'll just mention a few since we are time constrained. Uh, maybe real-time aggregation. This is your classic um, approach that you'd be doing in Hadoop, but again, streaming. Um, so you're not looking at this on a batch by day um, basis. Instead, as it comes in, you're updating your counts or other aggregate aggregations. Perhaps you're building the dashboard. Um, so some extension of this, of, of the real-time aggregation. I'm particularly interested in the idea of decision-making where you will be responding to information in your environment and taking some action. So what are some of the common real-time characteristics of such systems? Well, you're consuming streams of events. You are being event-oriented. As an event occurs, you may take some action. You may want to compute. You may be doing something downstream. You want to go and minimize the latency from the arrival of that event to that uh, potential computation. Certainly not hours. Ideally, going down to seconds or below in terms of that threshold of latency. Such systems are often called complex event processing, or you could call it stream processing. It doesn't matter. These are the concepts. The one thing that we are not doing here is doing hard real-time systems. Uh, oh, one last thing. You might have written one of your own type systems in the back. In fact, I'm going to show you what you might have written in the past. So you might have written something like this. Does this look familiar? Well, it should because it is about as generic as you get with a Unix pipeline. Um, but what I wanted to show here is, is that you have composition. So you're being able to go and build this pipeline out of reusable filters. Another nice property, you can rerun this pipeline if any intermediate step failed. But some problems. Um, I obviously uh, didn't show some of the details around you know, tailing and whatnot. Um, but there's also these aspects of how do you go and implement these other things, such as joins, windows. But most importantly, how would you scale that thing up? I mean, I think we can all think about how that could be done. You might go and in some way describe um, uh, one set of files as being processed by this machine, one set of files by some other machine, but you have to go and actually manage that uh, partitioning yourself. Um, so at Rackspace, we're um, using this um, uh, framework for complex event processing called Esper. Um, which has very much the same properties, or again, these, this homegrown code. And here's the problem. You need to ensure all relevant events about that given customer, it's in one place. 
All right, if I'm going to be able to know something about this given customer, I need to bring in all the relevant information. I have to go and put that in one place uh, for that to happen. We have to have some locality. Um, again, in terms of a um, this Rackspace example where we're implementing global alarms, we want to allow customers some degree of customization. So we don't want to make it too hard coded. Then run some computation. So again, a very classic complex event processing system. And simple sharding, the one that we might just know, be able to do um, um, quite readily um, by say, well, maybe we'll do it all by all by customers and whatnot, it doesn't necessarily um, get us as far as we'd like because you might have, again, sharded on some other key, you might need to shard on multiple keys. So what observations can we make? Obviously, small problems are easy. Um, how do you make a small, a large problem easier? You divide and conquer it. Um, to divide and conquer, you need to have some horizontal scaling. We're no longer building systems such that they always will require just that larger machine. Instead, we build so that they can scale to a cluster of, of such machines. But what do we know? The more machines we add to the mix, the more likely we're going to have failure as well, especially since we like to use commodity systems. Um, and once we have failure, then we have to go and coordinate. Um, so I have seen, and maybe you've seen in your own environments, that some, sometimes people will propose add Zookeeper or add some coordination system. And that just doesn't go and make the problem go away, even if Zookeeper is awesome. You still need to go and consider how do you manage failure? So yes, Zookeeper can go and give you all this in its toolbox, and it's fantastic as a consequence. But I'll tell you that that doesn't, you know, just assuming that you have distributed locking in your environment doesn't tell you how to recover from a failure and then going and releasing those distributed locks. Um, the solution is not reboot the cluster. Um, how many have done that? Um, so that's not a solution. We want to be, it's okay for a, a given node in the cluster to fail, but rebooting the cluster defeats the purpose of running the cluster. So Storm um, has some uh, terminology, which I will um, introduce by um, as we go through, but there is this idea of an event source, which we call spouts. Um, uh, we have event processing nodes called bolts and some topology to link it together in a directed acyclic graph. There is strong support for partitioning and fault tolerance. These key elements that we started with in th terms of thinking about how would I go and be able to build up a problem that I could divide and conquer on. Storm is written in Clojure, but it exposes a, J a Java API. Um, hence my um, use of Jython here, although of course you could use some IPC mechanism to talk um, with you know, a C Python, for example, and that was actually done um, in the talk on Tuesday where they were looking at the Parsley system for that support. It uses Zookeeper to uh, manage things, but you don't necessarily see it, although you can use it as a resource for your own coordination and as part of the Apache incubator. Actually, there are some other Apache incubator projects that are competing in this space. Probably the most notable would be Spark Streaming. Um, it actually um, looks um, great in terms of uh, the uh, support you can do with that, um, especially with its Python integration. I think it's the, the top contender and has some nice properties that um, uh, one can look at that um, uh, in terms of being functional that you do not see in uh, Storm. These others, Samza and S4, I don't know. I think that these are not uh, nearly as competitive. And there's some interesting stuff around there like zero VM as well that you could potentially be doing. 
So Storm lets you partition streams so you can break down the size of your problem, that returning to that idea of being able to divide and conquer your problem. If the node fails, Storm will restart it. But here's an even more important aspect of what that means. Oftentimes when we are thinking about building systems, especially distributed systems, we want to think about what are the invariants provided by the underlying framework. What does it give us? Um, and this actually helps explain also why you have this distinction between an event source and storm and event bolts, this, these processing nodes. Because sources are the things that you are pr producing events that have to eventually be acknowledged in storm. Okay, so that you can ensure that all events are in fact eventually processed. And when I said eventually, by the way, it actually means in an eventually consistent scheme. Um, and likewise, uh, this idea of bolts distinguishing that because you can always replay for them. The, hence this uh, topology and the topology in terms of how many nodes you might have. So this is describing how your cluster is being split up in terms of its resources. Here's the um, perhaps one of the more important invariants that's being provided. The number of nodes for a given sp spout, maybe a Kafka event source, um, the number of nodes for a given bolt, maybe that something that is actually doing some interesting processing of that event is held constant. So during the lifetime of this topology, you know that you always have seven nodes for um, your Kafka ingest, um, your Kafka spout. What does that mean in terms of your ability to know exactly what's going on in your environment in order to main appropriate counters in other state? It's very strong, okay? So Storm is taking in account one extremely important aspect of how you div divided that problem up. Because during the lifetime of this topology, if you always know that someone is handling this problem, and you can always go, think about if we had people here, you can always go to that person um, now you don't have to think about, oh, what happens if um, we add some additional people? It's nice to be able to scale up problems, but that is a separate issue in terms of scaling up the size of a topology. You would do that outside of a given um, a run of your real-time computation. Um, and I'll, if that isn't sufficient motivation, I'll give you an example in just a moment. Um, okay, I think I'm running a little bit slow, so I'm going to uh, try to speed up now. Um, but these are most important concepts, your, your takeaways. So you have computational locality. You know that the events for a given node are the ones that are supposed to be there, because that's how you define your routing. Um, you can route on some sort of what they call field groupings. Um, again, an example is your customer, a tenant in a cloud, um, a region of some kind, some way of breaking up the problem space in terms of your events. And again, what possibilities do you have if you knew all of the information you needed to know about a given customer and it was in one place? It changes how you think about things. So normally when you go and write your queries and say, um, you know, using a relational database, the data is over there and you bring it to you for a given computation. Instead, in systems like Storm, you move the computation to, to the data. That is the fundamental idea in a MapReduce system like Storm, like Hadoop. Um, but unlike something like Hadoop, um, this is in real time. So you're able to keep all of that data in memory, compute on it in real time, and do something interesting. So 
I, I should mention, of course, since it's mapping, um, you, you might have multiple customers on a given node, so you have to consider that. Uh, but that's an easy distinction to make. So again, you will know that it will be on this node and only on this node. Um, there are other ways of routing, such as random shuffling, um, global grouping, which means that there's just one node, everything goes there, obviously not scalable, but useful for getting totals. Um, Storm will track that success. All you have to do is consider what your retries are. And there are other ways of doing this in terms of doing exactly once event processing, but knowing that at least once all events were successively, successfully observed and computed on um, is pretty fantastic. Again, think back to that pipeline, that Unix pipeline I was showing you. That's that same idea. If the pipeline goes down, I can retry it. Of course, you have to handle retry. But what does that look like? Um, here's the first Python code. It's the easiest, right? Um, if you've already seen that record, then you can ignore it. Otherwise, process it. If you retry um, this computation, then you, if you haven't seen it in the, in the context of actually being successful with it, then you can do that retry. All right, that's a merge function. It's a simple, it can be that simple. But it will depend on the nature of your problem. For instance, if I am doing something that's transactional in its nature, um, you are um, wiring me $1,000, okay? Um, you can retry that many times, and I'll be very happy about that. So don't think that um, retries are always going to be successful, and that's the nature of eventually consistent systems. Now, sometimes you actually have to have strong consistency. Um, and there are, of course, other ways. You could go and have some sort of balancing compensation or something like that and say, well, give me back that $1,000. Um, and, and actually, in real wiring of uh, funds, that, in fact, does happen. Um, oh, uh, another thing, um, and you see this in any type of streaming systems, your streaming should not capture everything that comes through. Uh, this is that you know old uh, thing. You know, in order to do your computations, you have to download the internet. If you're doing web crawling, sure you do that, um, but again, that's done in an appropriate system. So you have to window. Um, another cap caveats would be around there are no uh, query languages. Um, you have to build your own, and that's actually kind of interesting. Again, with um, Parsley has some approaches. I expect that we will see these things emerge over time. Think of these as building blocks that give you these capabilities. But again, these capabilities are a lot like a Unix pipeline, Imagine, and we know what we could build with those. Um, so you may have to um, make your own, maybe use some of these other libraries. Okay, I'm gonna go and just skip through this a little bit. Um, except that I will say that um, Zookeeper is an important aspect of um, most systems that you would build. And so you probably will be interacting with in some way. So your um, spouts are ultimately um, responsible. Their event sources, they're responsible for ensuring that all events were at, um, eventually played through successfully, uh, eventually acknowledged. Um, and you need to go and ensure that appropriate handshaking. So as you are consuming from Kafka, you are updating your offsets in it accordingly. Uh, uh, I should tell you that, uh, again, as some experience with Zookeeper, if you actually try to do, uh, one thing I didn't mention at the very beginning is, is that people will run a million events a second uh, through a storm node and um, uh, and of course you can have many of those nodes um, running. Um, if you try to do a million events or more per second against Zookeeper, that's not gonna work. You have to do some sort of clever batching just like uh, Storm does. Okay. So, and so you get into things like this in terms of the Kafka handshaking, what that would look like. And I will go back through this in just a moment, but I need to move on. So you can have 
uh, spouts like this, um, and some of these are already written, um, mostly in Java, but or in Scala, but the advantage of Storm is it's multilingual in the sense that it all runs on the JVM. You could run feeds like Twitter through. You can pull in data from Cassandra. The important thing to know is it's not that difficult to implement, and I'll show you in just a moment. Um, another thing is, is that you can push or pull events into the system. There isn't something where Storm is just saying you can only, it will only accept events at a certain time. You can always um, push events in. But it will ask you when it wants events as well. So you can use that to help balance things. Um, again, you're going to be using that topology sizing invariant to know how your work is being split up. So you might go and have um, something like a real-time dashboard. You might be using Rackspace Cloud Files or uh, some other um, cloud provider to send things out. You might have some sort of uh, real-time decision-making. I'm interested in auto-scaling. Um, in an environment, you might often have contradictory information about how things are working. Converge on some action. That's the point of which, why you're bringing all that data in one place. You may have um, something along these lines where you are doing some sort of real-time aggregation. A um, couple of minutes, I will describe um, Python on Storm using Clamp, which I briefly described in the Lightning Talk yesterday as well. Um, let's face it, Python is a great fit for writing your Storm code. Um, and we have this system called Clamp that allows you to readily wrap your Python class, classes so they can be readily used from Java, in some cases in just one line of code. Um, so I discussed this yesterday where you could go and um, have some bar clamp class. Um, this is sort of a hello world example. Um, you can readily in um, uh, a couple lines that are unique to um, clamp, just go and um, add it. You can construct an Uber jar. Um, I'm in Germany, I can say this. Um, an Uber jar, your one jar um, or single jar, build it, has everything and distribute it to um, Storm. Um, you can use it in this fashion, but here's what it really looks like. Here's some code that you could readily use. Say you have a monitoring spout. You're going to be opening up your connection to Kafka. Um, there, again, I, I actually gave this talk at Rackspace. It looks like a, um, there's an in internal system that, um, of course, we pu talk about publicly called Adam Hopper, but again, some other type of feed like Twitter. Um, you can go and read parse events by as it's asking for it from next tuple, next tuple. But again, if you have something where you're pushing events, you can emit at any time. And then you're responsible for managing these callbacks, uh, fail and act. What do you do under those circumstances? Um, perhaps you want to go and do some sort of computation on this. What would it look like? This is the pseudocode associated with it. Um, this is all that you need to, this is the basic thing that you need to implement. You need to implement these three methods. You're pretty much done. How complicated is that? It could be like your Unix pipeline. It could be something that's um, really simple or it could be more complicated. Again, if I'm trying to weigh events that are telling me, oh, it's going this way and it's going that way and I have to figure out what really is happening. But that's the advantage of having it all in one place. So conclusions about this. Storm lets you horizontally scale out your real-time architecture. You have to consider partitioning and fault tolerance. In fact, to me, this is, these are the key questions you answer. This is how you actually think about what it means to divide and conquer your large problem so that it works on this cluster of machines. Answer these questions, and you get to go from what you were previously doing in terms of a simple Unix pipeline to which was analyzing log files, something very similar to something that can be scalable and, again, real time. All right. You can choose your favorite language, but I know what your favorite language here is. Um, it's Python. And 
you know, you could again use um, some of the mechanisms that are out there in terms of communicating uh, via CPython or whatnot, but you could also use again Jython and tie it directly into this big data um, uh, system. So I, I definitely would advocate for it. Uh, I should. Um, your strategies will work with Storm, such as test driven development. Have fun. So this talk is available um, on my GitHub um, repo, Jim Baker Talks, and any questions? <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Uh, so as you mentioned, for data locality, uh, for example, I have a multi-data computer environment, I have multiple data sources. Mm -hmm. And consumers are commonly in each of the data centers. Mm -hmm. And now I want to present a unified uh, computing basis of consumer. Yes. So in terms of stock, now currently we have different topologies running in both the data centers. And that basically gives us all that we have to shift the data mm -hmm. from the platform so that we can look by it. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, sure. So um, the question is along the lines of uh, they currently have um, a mul multiple data centers. They're running a storm cluster in each of these, and they need to go and consolidate that information in one place. Now, the first thing to know is that you do not want to, th there are very few systems that will span multiple data centers. And storm is not one of those systems. Okay, you are going to be running a storm cluster in one data center, another storm cluster in some other data center. The way that you would um, do the spanning problem is use some uh, queue to ensure that data is pushed to some central data center. You may, you, you may need to go, of course, consider what failure you might have. It gets more complicated. So you, you basically move that problem to your queues use something like Kafka, for example. Mm. Yes. Uh, that's the best, yeah. I mean, there's certainly not something that you can do in Storm because again, it really is depending on the fact that, you know, it's running on Zookeeper and Zookeeper doesn't spam multiple data centers. I mean, yes, you can in a theoretical sense. Um, that's not gonna be great. Um, so don't do that. Um, use systems that actually are proven to work um, and you're not just um, doing some interesting innovation along those lines, which you will find is not fantastic innovation. Um, so we are, we are, so yeah, I, I don't know if there are any other questions. I, this is something that I can take out afterwards because I obviously would love to spend lots of time on it. Um, anything else? So. Um, I guess we're done, um, so please ask me those questions that you might have. Thanks.